Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, we're, we're very pleased to have with us this evening uh, veteran journalist Bob Thompson, uh, here to talk about his new book, Revolutionary Roads, Searching for the War that Made America Independent and All the Places It Could, could Have Gone Terribly Wrong. Um, now, how many of you have uh, heard the term staff ride? <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't, um, which is most of you, uh, it's, it's a military training exercise that involves uh, walking uh, former battlefields and drawing uh, relevant lessons by retracing the decisions and actions of those who previously fought there. Uh, Bob's book is, as, as he calls it, a one-person staff ride of the Revolutionary War. Uh, and to write it, uh, he traveled to places where history-shaping events occurred in the war, seeing, uh, seeing them for himself, and often seeking out experts to help him understand uh, what happened. Uh, another term that Bob uses to describe what he did and what he's written is traveling history. Uh, and the net effect of it is, uh, especially in the hands of as talented a writer as Bob, uh, is to make history that much more interesting, entertaining, and meaningful. Uh, Bob spent 24 years writing and editing feature stories at the Washington Post. He edited the paper's uh, Sunday magazine, wrote author profiles for the style section, and developed a, a particular interest in bringing complex historical narratives to life. Uh, what's very evident in his book on the Revolutionary War uh, is not only uh, Bob's enormous enthusiasm for the subject, uh, but also his sense of humor, abiding curiosity, extensive research he did, uh, and his very lively writing style. Uh, one of the engaging features of the book, too, is Bob's penchant for noting how so many turning points in the war might have gone another way. As one reviewer observed, it is remarkable and disconcerting how many battles turned on luck, misunderstandings, and coincidences. Uh, to talk Bob through his story and help moderate this evening, we're fortunate to have another uh, first-rate former Washington Post journalist, Glenn Frankel. Uh, his 27 years at the paper included overseas assignments in Britain, South Africa, and Israel. Uh, and it was in Israel where his reporting won a, a Pulitzer Prize in 1989. His experiences abroad also led to, to two books, uh, Beyond the Promised Land about the Arab-Israeli conflict and uh, uh, Ravonia's Children about white activists in South Africa's uh, anti-apartheid movement. Uh, since uh, leaving journalism, uh, Glenn has taught and has gone on to write uh, several other excellent books about great American movies, uh, notably The Searchers, High Noon, and most recently, Midnight Cowboy. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob Thompson and Glenn Frankel. Hi there, nice crowd. I see some familiar faces, even the ones behind the masks. So uh, I know a lot of you haven't read this book yet, but I have. And I have to tell you, uh, as I've told Bob, and I'm going to embarrass him now, just, I mean, it's a, a wonderful history book, which I expected. I knew Bob would do a lot of really authoritative research, and he did all of that. It's also a great travelogue, um, because he goes all the way from Quebec down to Georgia and hits every, every site in between. And, and but and a great character study, They're just wonderful characters in it. It's also incredibly charming. I mean, it's entertaining. Um, he really knows how to, you know, the characters in it, I think, are really the key. And, and the characters are not just the characters uh, who participated in the Revolutionary War, but the folks he meets along the way here, the park rangers and the amateur historians and the academics. And, you know, he really... 
um, using his journalistic experience and skills. He really knows how to talk to people. He always keeps going till he finds the right person. Um, some of these folks are highly opinionated, but they're incredibly knowledgeable and sort of fun to meet and, and hear. So um, the book is just vastly entertaining as well as telling you, you know, an enormous amount. And Bob, you know, I have to ask the first question, which is, why did you decide to do the whole American Revolution? <laughs> I mean, you know, there are a lot of books out there about one battle or one place or I don't know. Um, what did you have in mind and, and how, you know, how long did it take to do this? Almost as long as the revolution, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much. Um, I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, I first want to thank everybody for coming um, and to thank the bookstore for being here and for having been here as long as I've been in town. Um, it's, a, it's a great institution. And I want to wave at my two daughters who were right <laughs> over there. <laughs> and uh, my wife, who's hiding behind somebody who has probably some opinions on why it took as long as she <laughs> did. She's behind Muffson over there. There we are. <laughs> um, I decided to do the whole war because that's the way my brain works. It's, I just wanted to do... I knew I wanted to do another book that involved traveling and reporting, and I thought about the Revolutionary War for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. And um, <laughs> I thought I'd just do the whole thing. And um, nobody told me not to do that. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I did not quite fully understand the scope of the project. Um, and uh, was there a second half of this question? Uh, well, so what, uh, I, I want to ask what surprised you, but not in terms of what you discovered, but, but the surprising aspects of having, of, of taking on a whole war up and down a whole seaboard. What, you know, did you think it was going to take seven years? I mean, what no, was your plan? No, um, I signed a contract that was going to take three years. I knew that wasn't true, but um, and so did my editor. But my editor actually forgot by the time I turned it in. He forgot how long it had been. <laughs> um, what was surprising about the amount of time and effort it took was simply that every single time you get into one of those little battles that other people write whole books about, if you're me, you kind of have to know what's going on. I mean, you, I would find an expert to, to take me around the battlefield, and that was enormously helpful because it gave me a vehicle to tell the story. But, you know, I had to make sure that the story that the expert was telling me was more or less correct, which means I had to do a lot of reading. And so each time I got to one of those stages in the book, it took three times as long as it was supposed to. Define a lot of reading. How many books did you think you read for this thing? Uh, I have not counted them. But um, after the book was submitted, we had some rugs in our house uh, redone, which was something I had promised that we would get to after I was finished the book. In order to do that, I had to carry all the books down into the basement. <laughs> the answer is hundreds. <laughs> I'm not saying I read every single one of them. No. but. Um, I bought a lot of them. So, you know, I'm going to wander around here a bit and not go chronologically, which is my natural <laughs> inclination, but it's, your subtitle to me suggests the thing that I found most interesting about the book, the second half of the subtitle. Subtitle is Searching for the War that Made America Independent and All the Places It Could Have Gone Terribly Wrong. And, um, well, can you enumerate a bit what you mean by that by that last phrase? Terribly wrong, or yeah, all the are places, all the places it could have gone places. terribly wrong? Yeah, well, that starts right away. Um, uh, I, I won't. I mean, I could give you a couple of examples of them, but it was not at all clear that our side, as I will call it, was gonna was going to win this war. It's not at all clear. Um, there were so many times, especially in the first couple of years, when one change 
mean, it's something that happened after the Battle of Brooklyn. Like, who knew there was a battle in Brooklyn? Not me when I started. Uh, <laughs> big battle. Um, could have ended the war. Um, and not well, right? And not well. And that turned out to be the case pretty much up to the end. Uh, I'm going to spoil the ending a little bit by saying we did win at Yorktown, <laughs> <laughs> which most people know. But the war in the South, we didn't know so much about, and there were, there were a number of occasions when things went badly in the South and could have changed the nature of the war. Uh, there's another thing, there's another way it could have ended, as opposed to us just losing. And that, again, is something that I hadn't thought about, which is neither side had to win or lose totally. Um, they could have just stopped. And the way that would likely have happened is that the European powers who were involved in the war would have decided that they'd had enough, um, predominantly France, which was getting sick of pouring resources into this thing that they didn't seem to be winning. And had that happened, they would have convened a peace conference at which they would have held all the cards. And what, again, likely would have happened is that some kind of peace agreement would have been made which I refer to in the book as a kind of a, a, a game of freeze tag, like diplomatic freeze tag, like everything stops. So the British at that point held most of the South, so that would stay with the British. They held parts of northern New England. Um, they held New York City and Long Island. And also, they held everything west of the Appalachians out to the Mississippi, which, as you know, they did not retain. In, the, in, the, in reality, but had that happened, you can imagine what a very different ending that would have been. You'd have a, you'd have a much weaker United States at the end of that. And there's a wonderful Latin phrase for that kind of diplomatic freeze trade, which I don't even know how to pronounce, but I'll give it a try. It's called uti possidetus. It means keep everything right the way it is. And, and uh, that, was, that was a possible outcome. Hmm. Um, let me take sort of ask you about one example that you use in describing how fragile this thing was. I mean, we all know after, or well, we've all seen Washington crossing the Delaware with his troops. Um, Christmas Eve night or Christmas night? Uh, Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, ambushing the, the Hessians in Trenton in a great victory. But eight days later, there was another sort of Battle of Trenton, right? There was. It's my actual. How'd that go? It's, it's actually kind of my favorite um, battle of the war, so I'll, I'll go on a little bit about that. First thing I will say is that the first battle of Trenton did not have to come out the way it did. There were a lot of things that could have gone wrong. A lot of things did go wrong, and I won't go into the details, but um, the Washington's army and Washington himself lucked out. There were supposed to be three groups of men going across the Delaware that day, and two of them just never made it. Um, so they were supposed to all meet up at Trenton, and that didn't happen. But the Battle of Trenton, they did surprise the Hessian garrison at Trenton, and that turned out to be as a minor military thing, but it was hugely important politically. But what happened at that point is Washington's army was made up of uh, people who had signed up for a, a limited period of time, and they were their enlistments were about to run out. And so he needed to do something else, and he had to plead with them to stick around for a while. Um, and so he went back across the river, back to Trenton. Meanwhile, the British, who had been upset by the, by the um, original Battle of Trenton, were coming after him, and he knew that. And he didn't know quite what he was going to do. And so he set up below the Assunpink River, which if you know Trenton, it's, it's the south end of Trenton, and waited for the British to come and sent some guys out to delay them, which those guys did a very good job of that, and that did not have to happen. And so he held them off that evening. And the British commander said, basically, well, we'll get them in the morning. They're not going anywhere. 
And instead, they got up in the middle of the night and snuck out and went to Princeton and fought a little battle there and, and escaped. But if that battle had gone differently, which it easily could have, nobody would remember the first battle. So that's, that's my extended version of that one. Let me ask you, um, for example, using, using Trenton as an example, how much of this could we see today? What, and part of what your book is about is getting an authoritative person to walk you places yeah. or show you where the next hill was or yeah. where things were. Is there any, can we go look at the Battle of Trenton in any sense? Yeah, there's a big, there's a big monument for the first Battle of Trenton. <laughs> okay. And using that monument as a locator, you can see where the cantons likely were and you you can, you can walk around and get a sense of, of what happened in that battle. Um, the second Battle of Trenton, not so much. <laughs> and uh, the chapter that I wrote is called The Battle of the Rusty Pole because I was looking for the only marker that I knew about indicating the, the Battle of Second Trenton and I could not find it. And eventually I called a guy who spent Coincidentally, seven and a half years doing a really amazing website about all of Revolutionary um, War sites in New Jersey. And I called him up and said, Al, I can't find that. And he walked me through to where it was, and I could see the rusty pole where the sign had been on the top, and it wasn't there anymore. <laughs> um, so that is not a well commemorated battle. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, say I have a week, and uh, you know, not seven years, but a week, and I want to see some of the more uh, something evocative that I can still see, uh, while ignoring, say, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Okay. But some, you know, where would you go? Where would you send me? I'm going to give you two places. One is upstate New York, um, a little town called Oriskany, where there's a battle. It's a, it's a small battle, it's intense, it's, it's wonderfully preserved chunk of real estate. Um, and I had, a, I had a fantastic tour there. I was, I was really the only person on the battlefield with a park ranger touring me around because it was raining. Um, and, and I just love it. And where's Ariskany? Yeah, Ariskany is just south of Rome, New York. Um, uh, well, I know that because I grew up in New York. But we'll tell yeah, me, folks, okay. what Rome is. <laughs> Rome is. Uh, I think of Rome as being like you know, it's out the it's out the turnpike a ways, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, um, and the other place I would send you would be Kings Mountain, in the very northwest corner of South Carolina, um, because it was absolutely one of the most significant battles of the war. It came out of nowhere. No uh, continental troops were there. No British troops were there. There were what were called provincial troops, which were well-trained loyalists. But a lot of the battle was between militias, um, and not even formal militias. Um, and the, again, our side, I'll say for the, size of the sake of simplicity, some of them had marched over the mountains from, from East Tennessee. They're called over mountain men. They had pinned a British force on the top of the mountain, and if you walk up that mountain and think about what they had to do to climb the mountain against troops with bayonets, um, it's uh, evocative is the word I think you used, and I would, it's, it's a remarkable place. And how crucial was it to the Absolutely war in the South? Absolutely crucial to the war in the South, which was going extremely poorly for our side at that point. And uh, Kings Mountain came out of nowhere. The, uh, the, the British commander, Lord Cornwallis, at that point was planning to invoid, uh, invade North Carolina right away, and he was already in Charlotte. And when Kings Mountain happened, he had to go into winter quarters and wait until the next year, which, um, for those of you who know who Nathaniel Green is, it allowed Nathaniel Green to get to the south and work some difficult magic. But without Kings Mountain, none of that happens, and everything's, 
everything's different. We don't know what would have happened, but we know it wouldn't have unfolded the way it did. So I'm going to take us back chronologically just a little bit. You know, um, I have sort of the average knowledge of the revolution. I thought after Saratoga, which is, uh, you know, 1777, uh, 70. yeah. um, where they stopped the British coming south and preventing that sort of hookup between the British in the north, in New York, and the British there, and then the French enter the war that I sort of thought, and, and in fact, you say, you entitle one chapter, Saratoga, the accidental battle that won the revolution. Is that a battle that actually won the revolution? Because uh, it took a little liberty there. Um, <laughs> it, it took a while for it to win the revolution. The reason that it is, it, it's almost universally seen as a major turning point. And the reason for that is that it is it was influential in getting the French to come into the war, um, and as we sometimes forget, we don't win that war without the French. Period. End of story. So that was that's why that was a big deal. Um, but a lot happened after that. Yeah, and uh, Benedict Arnold's kind of a co-star of the show in that one, right? What's your what's your approach to the the great traitor? Um, <laughs> One of the guys I talked to for the book um, is a man named James Kirby Martin, who wrote a really remarkable take on Benedict Arnold because he said, everything we know about Benedict Arnold, everything we think about Benedict Arnold is seen through the frame of his treason. So let's look at what happened to Benedict Arnold and what his life was like before the treason and not through that frame. And so he arguably was the hero of the Battle of Saratoga. The argument for whether he was or what was not is too complicated for me to explain here. But one of the things that happened, fortunately for me, while I was reporting the book before I wrote it, is that new evidence was produced uh, showing that the traditional version of Arnold in the second Battle of Saratoga, just to confuse things, there were two of them, uh, it was wrong. And it's just one of those things that you can't take for granted that history is going to stay still because somebody found a document and it, it changed the interpretation. So after Saratoga, um, things begin to turn south. Right, slowly but surely, and that's the part that I knew the least about. Um, I'm particularly, in, well, a number of things interest me. I mean, the British turn south around 1780, right? And they take Charleston, which is the richest town in America and the sort of linchpin town, and yet gradually things go wrong for them. Um, how does that play out? They turn south earlier than that, actually. They, they start in late 78 and they come down and take Savannah and they end up taking Charleston after that but the reason they do that is because the war is stalemated in the north and meanwhile the French have come in and the British understand that they have to fight the French elsewhere not just in the 13 colonies and the Caribbean for instance is far more important to both sides than the 13 colonies because it's far richer in terms of um, its economic output um, based on horrific slavery. But so what are they going to do? They think, well, we'll go south because they had a belief that there were far more loyalists in the south than there were up in the north. And that turned out to be iffy. It looked like they were in a mop-up operation. But what then happened was the backcountry South Carolinians um, decided that they were not having this. And people, some of whose names are famous, Francis Marion the Swamp Fox, and some whose names are not famous, um, led partisan warfare down there where there was no serious continental there for months and months and changed the game and that's that's as close as I can get to summary um, 
and how much was it a war of, well, I don't know if they were called Americans yet, they were, of American versus American in the South? Uh, very much so. It was, it was very much a civil war. Um, there was civil war up in upstate New York as well, in New Jersey. It's not just in the South, but the South was the worst of it, and it was awful. Um, and not much more to be said than that. It was, it was truly awful. And the armies fought battles, and those are the kinds of things that, you know, they're awful in their own way, but they're not the same as neighbors killing neighbors. So, um, some of us who are from Virginia know about Lord Dunmore and the effort to enlist enslaved people um, to serve in the British, with the British. Um, and in Dunmore's case, he was going to, you know, they were going to win their freedom that way. It didn't work out in Virginia, but uh, a man, uh, tell us about John Lawrence and his effort well, in South Carolina. It didn't work out anywhere, not to put too fine a point on it, but Dunmore was the royal governor of Virginia, and his idea was he didn't have enough troops, and so he would invite only those enslaved to rebels. If you were enslaved to a loyal British uh, person, you were out of luck. So um, he invited them to, to um, come and fight with him, and hundreds and hundreds of people left their, left their enslavement and did so, and it ended very badly for them, largely because of disease rather than rather than actual battles. Um, there's a wonderful book, wonderful if you can stand the topic, called Pox Americana, about about smallpox during the American Revolution, which where it, where it was epidemic, and what happens when you get people who have been living in isolated areas. Um, and bring them together in large groups. They're, they're extremely vulnerable to smallpox and other diseases. Um, but um, moving ahead, Rhode Island was having trouble filling its quotas for um, getting people to enlist, and so they, somebody in Rhode Island decided that we should pay owners to free some slaves, and they could then um, come and come and fight as as free people. Um, it was a very very small number that actually did that, but it's it's historically important. And what happened in South Carolina in this regard? Well, in South Carolina, um, what happened was John Lawrence, who was somebody who was basically unknown um, until he showed up in Hamilton with a bit part. <laughs> Uh, I mean, he wasn't unknown to historians, but not, not well known. He had the idea that he should get his father, who was a major slaveholder and had been a major, major slave dealer in South Carolina, to give him some of his enslaved inheritance right now and let him form an army that would help defend South Carolina. And, um, that plan was blessed by the Continental Congress. It was blessed by his father, who changed his mind a little bit later on. Uh, but there was one hitch, which is that the states of um, South Carolina and Georgia had to approve it, and that did not happen. Um, and that's, that's one of the sort of more poignant what-ifs for me, is, is what if we had taken that seriously? And again, you never know. I mean, that's the nature of what if questions is you never actually know the answer, but you can wonder whether it would have changed um, the, the, whether it would have hastened the end of slavery if, if we had taken that seriously. It, it, it intrigued me when you wrote about this subject and you said, you know, that many thousands of enslaved people did um, hook up with the British at one point or another, and you described it as the largest slave slave rebellion in American history. I mean, by you know miles and miles. Um, I don't know if that was you characterizing it that way, or if you got that from someone else. But the notion of that of of that huge amount of people trying to flee slavery does seem to be the largest you know the largest rebellion before the Civil War. I, I think unquestionably. Um, I, I quote 
uh, a great historian named Gary Nash in that context. It's, it's his phrase, yeah. largest. Um, but I can't imagine that it's not. I mean, there were there were thousands and thousands who ran from the, their plantations, which was very hard to do and very dangerous. Uh, it was a difficult choice, but but they did. They ended up serving the British Army mainly as laborers and cooks, and they they not not very many of them picked up arms. But it was a huge movement of enslaved people, uh, again, predominantly in the South, although a lot of them ended up in, in New York eventually. Well, I was going to ask you, what happened to them? Uh, same thing has happened with disease. Um, some of them came north with Lord Cornwallis, who ends up at Yorktown, um, and they did not fare well there because he, he was, Yorktown was a siege. We're getting to the end of the story here, but it was a siege, and one of the things that happens in sieges is you try to starve people out, and Cornwallis said, okay, we've got all these black people here, and why don't we just kick them out of town because we can't feed them. Um, it's, it's not a happy story. So I want to actually would like to go to Yorktown. You know, I've been taking my family to the beach house in Virginia Beach for the last 15 years or so, and only when I read your book I realized that sort of one of the key instrumental elements of, of the Yorktown victory didn't occur at Yorktown, but just over the horizon see off from where our beach house is. Yeah, I don't know where your beach house is. It's but close to Fort Story, or the old okay, one was, okay, that's, which is right at the, you know, the upper tip yeah, there. Yeah, there's a, there's a big military base called Fort Story in Virginia Beach. And when I wanted to get into it, I got the third degree on the way in. I'm not even sure you could get in there now, but there's a tiny little um, park service park within the base. And so I went through the, I mean, I got everything out of my car and they opened every door and they checked for contraband of one kind or another. And then they warned me that I could only go to the park. I should not go any farther or I did not want to know what was going to happen. But when you get there, you get a walkway up to the beach where there's a couple of rusty telescopes and you can look out at open water, which was where the most important battle of the Revolutionary War was fought. <laughs> it was fought out of sight of land. And you could hear it from the land, but you couldn't see it. It lasted a couple of hours, and then it was days before anybody knew what had happened. And who was out there exactly? Uh, who was out there exactly were the French fleet, which had come to trapped the British at Yorktown, although they didn't know that's exactly what they were going to do when they set sail. But the French fleet had sailed out of the harbor to meet a British fleet which had come down from New York. Uh, no, um, no Americans were involved in this battle. It was the British and the French. And it was essentially a stalemated battle. Nothing dramatic happened. And <coughs> maybe a little too late, the French Admiral um, de Grasse decided, well, maybe I should get back and take care of, of the blockade that we interrupted to fight the British, and so he did that. Um, but had that battle gone the other way, there would have been no surrender at Yorktown. Well, the other thing that, that um, in this last sort of chapters of the book that surprised me was what Yorktown was itself, what kind of, that it was a siege. And, and uh, you alluded to it earlier, but tell us a little bit about how long it took and why Cornwallis got caught. Uh, I'm not going to be good on how long it took. I mean, Cornwallis didn't like being in the South and being on the defensive, on the deep South. And so he chose to come to Virginia
exactly the right time when the French Navy was arriving. What happened to Henry Clinton? Wasn't he supposed to show up at one point with like 5,000? Uh, Henry Henry was supposed to do that. He was he had troops in New York. I, they wouldn't have done anything if they'd gotten there. I mean, the the French and, and the the uh, in Washington had more troops than that. They came because they none of the people in New York wanted none of the officers in charge in New York wanted to be people who went down in history as having failed to try to save a trapped British army. And that's, that's why they came. But they, they got there. By the time they got there, it was over. Um, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary yeah. surrender. American side in Charleston, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're trapped. This turned out to be an important tipping point in terms of the science of this It was not clear that it was nobody, nobody knew what the surrender happened to be in that year, but it ended up to be And all right, I, I mean, it made me want to like, put down the book and go to New York Town like, tomorrow. I think I was going to ask you about that. And <laughs> come with me, but what do you see down there? Uh, what you will see is pretty useful, almost entirely reconstructed. It was reconstructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s, and there's one or two things that <coughs> are still uh, the real the real fortifications. But you can get a very good idea of the battle and of the siege and where it was, and you can get a notion of how the siege progressed. And you can see where Alexander Hamilton um, won his 10 minutes of glory, which is portrayed in the musical as having won the Revolutionary War all by himself. But, uh, well, that's how he portrayed it. <laughs> well, he needed, uh, he's a very interesting character, as you know, and I can't do his whole biography here, but he needed that bit of glory to get himself credentialed. Um, he'd been a, he'd been a, a, a in the war for a long time, mostly as Washington's most important aide, and he was sick of that, and he wanted he wanted that chance to 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 go down in history, but more importantly, to go into his future as someone who had fought in a battle, and he got that um, by um, shoving aside someone else and getting Washington to make him command this this small part of the of the siege of Yorktown. Well, well, a lot of people got their reputations, Lafayette and others, and, and others failed to, but I have to ask you a George Washington question. He starts out almost losing the war in New York, right, in Brooklyn. And he starts out almost losing it in Boston. Actually. Well, first in Boston, <laughs> then, in, you know, then worked or his way tried. around to he New York. he tried to lose it in Boston. And, but it looked in, Bo in New York where he really blew it. We won't get into details yeah. now, but he's on the wrong side of the Hudson and lots of bad things happening. When the British are starting to arrive in huge numbers, he gets through that. Did he, was he always a bad general? Did he become a better general? What's, what's your take on, on George as a military commander? Um, there's a battle called Brandywine, which was a very big battle, which is not that well remembered. Um, it's, it's fought near Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, near Orin, and a huge battle. And uh, I had a wonderful tour of Brandywine, uh, given by a guy named Mark Harris, who, who wrote the most recent book on the battle. Um, and Harris at one point was asked that question you're just asking about <laughs> Washington, by which point we knew all of the mistakes that he had made at Brandywine, one after another. Um, and he just said, you know, he was a very good leader. He made a great president. Terrible battlefield general. And there's a difference between a battlefield general and a strategist. But, uh, but Washington was uh, often in charge on, on battlefields, and he wasn't good at it. Um, and 
he has many other important qualities that we should remember on President's Day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so look, I've, I've tortured him long enough. To, it, can we take some questions? Um, we've got microphones on just on this side over here, but please feel free if anybody has a question for Bob. Can you walk over to here, sir? They're taping this, and it'd be good if you stood at the microphone. Uh, I've always heard that the Continental Army was very poorly armed, uh, that depended a great longer periods. Thanks so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, so, I mean, we're in DC here um, and in a current political moment where there's been calls on um, mostly the right, but also to an extent the left, to resort to violence to solve political concerns. Um, and the Revolutionary War being a big moment in American history um, at the start where that happened, I was wondering. If in your research, um, you uh, reflected on um, or came to insights about uh, when is it justifiable to resort to violence um, in response to political problems? Uh, that's a great question. And again, that's, that's not something that I cover or I deal with in the book. It's, um, it's a very difficult question. And at the time of the revolution, Congratulations on becoming a friend. <laughs> Just find that. Um, you talk about things that could have gone wrong. Did you run across somebody who you thought was just a genius, a strategy, and just over and over again showing prowess? 
militia, I mean, the opening days of the war, um, when the British march um, in the country, it's militiamen, right? You take them out. Uh, militiamen and minutemen is, is the issue. Um, What's the difference? Uh, minutemen were created, militiamen were in New England for decades. Just, um, you know, the significance of them at the time. Um, I've seen the numbers before, but it struck me again something like 300 British soldiers killed um, in that, or killed or wounded in that, and, and 90 yeah. Americans on that opening day. Um, the, the bloodshed of that day and the <coughs> way that the Americans got it started um, just always stuns me. It's uh, an interesting opening day. Yeah, it's a very complicated story that was made there. Um, and one of the things that I learned from a very interesting guy who um, I talked to in Lexington, he's, he can't be proved, but he's pretty sure from everything he does that somebody on the other side fired the first shot. Um, The intersection, yeah, the yeah. but just um, to, to, to just be brief, one of the things that happened there is I, because I was in the landscape of that time, I was like, you're in the landscape, you can see. Ridge Front there, in Marion's corner. And so they 
came down. said that uh, Washington was a federal battlefield general, but he was the battlefield general for most of the war. How come the federal general thinks it's changed and somebody else might have better? Uh, well, there was an exception. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk and an interesting book. Uh, I'm delighted to read, actually. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to pick up on, for a minute, what I made, on the um, earlier question about the vote for violence. Um, your subheading, where things could have gone terribly wrong, um, it's kind of, I think, resonant. seem to me that there were probably times during the war where it could have gone terribly right by the whole thing just stopping. Yes. You know, the English-speaking uh, world suffered three terrible civil disasters over a few hundred years. The first one was the English Civil War in the mid-1600s. The second one was the American Revolution. And the third one was the American Civil War. precedence for the next one. They were disasters. Um, so my question is, when you're doing a book, uh, maybe it's a different book, but when you're, <laughs> when you're doing the book, were there occasions when you thought, well, you know, maybe if the Continental Army had been defeated here, there would have been honorable peace, and it would have worked out quite well. Well, this gets me to the whole question of what else. I think that we should always ask questions like that, but you can't actually answer. You can't actually say what would have happened. But I'm going to go ahead and say that if during Washington's retreat to New Jersey, where things were at their worst before the Battle of Britain, uh, things were very grim, and the people in charge of the British Army and Navy really wanted there to be peace rather than a uh, battlefield. At least that's what they got accused of. And they didn't push very hard as, as Washington's army was retreating. And had they done so, they might have knocked out his army, which probably would have been better for what they wanted. But in any case, that was a moment when it, they, the, the revolution could have ended out of steam. It simply could have ended. And my own um, take on what would have happened after that, which bears no relation to any facts that we know, <laughs> is that we would have just become Canada. Yeah. You know, and that's the way it is. <laughs> 
we would have gotten our independence uh, eventually. Uh, that would have been All right, well, Canada's a good place to stop. We would have had better health care. Um, all right, well, Box here.